why are there so many biblical accounts of people resenting God's grace being given to others? You know, I read those moments, and I was sort of like, what is wrong? How do we go that wrong? And in, in that context, I want to read from Jonah, the last verse of chapter 3 and through chapter 4. And um, this is after him running off on the ship and being thrown into the sea and being eaten by a fish and preaching to the people of Nineveh. Then we come to this. And the book of Jonah records it like this. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be so angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be so angry about the vine? I do, he said. I am angry enough to die. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. And many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? When Jonah comes up in the lectionary, it's very hard for me not to talk about it. Jonah is such an unusual book. And it's kind of interesting that there is so much of a lack of disobedience in the book of Jonah. Well, except for all the disobedience on the part of Jonah himself. Everybody else in Jonah, it seems like, tries to do the right thing. Especially the Gentiles keep trying to do the right thing. But not Jonah. Never Jonah. In 4.2, he insists that he had to disobey. That God was just too gracious. And, and that really is his argument. I knew you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. That's from the NRSV translation. So he just asked God to kill him. If you are going to be this forgiving God, this gracious and accepting, well, just kill me. I would rather die than have you give this much love away, God. And to give it to people who just don't deserve it. I was reading something by a guy named Todd Hobby, and he wrote about this idea that sometimes people look for some kind of example of people they could point to who are just too bad to forgive. And, you know, people will come up with examples like Hitler or um, a few decades ago, Charles Manson, even Osama bin Laden. For Jonah, the Ninevites were his example of people he just wanted to consider too unforgivable. And Jonah seems especially blind to the fact that God has pursued him with love and with grace, even in his disobedience. Even when he runs away, God keeps coming after him. Without grace, the ship he was on would have just sunk. Without grace, Jonah would have just drowned. The fish would not have come. Jonah got a lot of grace, he actually, and he got a second chance to obey as well. Hobby also pointed out 
uh, kind of amusingly that really and truly even the fish is more obedient to God than Jonah himself is. When commanded, the fish vomited up Jonah. It's probably the you know, probably the only command to barf in the Bible. Of course, you know, really and truly, if we go in that direction, the, the vine and the worm are more obedient than Jonah when we read through this. Jonah really wanted God to destroy his enemies, not forgive his enemies. And, and so he goes out to pout, and he makes his little booth, and he sits down to wait, and really... Really, why is he out there waiting? He is still hoping beyond hope for some last-minute destruction to fall on the city of Nineveh. He's still hoping that maybe this forgiveness thing is still going to fall apart. And so God goes for an object lesson. This vine, this bush in some translations, it grows up quickly to give shade, and then it dies just as quickly the next day. And Jonah, again, he goes to his default position of just let me die and both times God asks him if he really if he has a reason if, if he has the right is it the right thing to do to be that angry and is it right well the first time Jonah has no answer at all but the second time Jonah feels justified yes I have a right to be angry and I'm angry enough to die but the object lesson is, Jonah, you have more compassion for that bush than you have for all those people. All those people. All those people who don't know the truths of God the way Jonah does. And of course, God mentions, and their cows. I've always loved that verse. It's one of my favorites. I, I did read a commentary saying maybe God brought up wealth to see if Jonah connected with that. Um, that was a new interpretation for me. I just kind of prefer to be amused that God brought up the cows. But here, God has to ask his prophet, shouldn't I care about these people? When God has to beg his hard-hearted child to accept God's own compassion, there is a problem. And if we question the love of God for lost people, even the worst of them, do we not lose sight, just like Jonah did, of how much God has pursued us, forgiven us, accepted us, even healed us? How can we accept the grace of God that is given to us and still struggle with how freely it's given to others? When Jesus told the parable of the workers in the vineyard, there is tension between God's justice and God's grace. In that parable, all the workers started out in the same situation. They were unemployed and they needed their daily work. And they may have started at different times throughout that day, but they all started from the exact same situation. A day's work meant a day's food for your family. They all started with the same need, and in the end, they're all offered the same reward for the service they gave. But it's not fair. It's not fair. There is a justice issue that they raise. They found work for the day and the resources they needed for their family for that day, but all of that was lost in the moment of believing that it just wasn't fair. But that's the point. This, fair, this parable is not about fairness, and it is not about justice. It's about grace and the generosity of God. The challenge is that God's grace in this parable goes against our sense of fairness of right and wrong. And it, and it raises the question, makes us wonder, are there Christians who will serve quietly and faithfully all of their lives, but then maybe even just a little, maybe a lot, resent seeing endless celebration about someone who turns to Jesus after years of living in brokenness and sin. There's a lady named Charlotte Cleghorn, and she writes that maybe, maybe we need to learn to celebrate our own discovery of God's graciousness more. You know, are we ungrateful for the mercy we have received, or... Maybe have we just forgotten how much grace God had for us and how wonderful it really was. 
she goes on to say that this parable reminds us that God is a lousy bookkeeper. But man, God has astounding generosity. The one thing that is really unique and easily lost in this parable is that the work itself is a gift. They needed it. It was a culture where day laborers earned one day's sustenance at a time. And that meant you needed that day's work. And you needed it desperately. The opportunity to work was a gift. The reward was a blessing. And maybe that's tough for us as disciples sometimes. It, maybe it, it matters how we see what we do for Jesus. Do we see it as something we have to do to either avoid hell or to earn heaven, and then somehow we're just servants begrudgingly doing what we have to do? Or do we see the work that we get to do for God as a gift in and of itself? It's a privilege that's been given to us. John Calvin said that when we see the work that God gives us to do and allows us to do and blesses us to be able to do, when it's a gift, we labor as children who want to please our parent, and we are dedicated to our parents' work. And that's when it's just us going into the family business. Do we want to be Christian wage slaves, or do we want to be children of God who are going into the family business? One, the second one, is a lot more fun. Jonah does end kind of abruptly. What did Jonah do? What came after all the pouting? What's the decision? Do you resent the forgiveness given to the undeserving, or do you fall in love with the grace and mercy of God? You know, maybe that's why the book ends so abruptly, because maybe we have to answer that for ourselves. We have to wrestle with our own struggles at times with resentment, whether it be resentment at undeserved grace given to others, or resentment of service we're given to do for God, but we don't do it like children going into the family business. We do it as servants who are meeting an obligation. In the end, maybe that abrupt conclusion is about leaving the question with us. We have to choose. Would you pray with me? God, help us to see. God, help us to celebrate the amount of grace that's been given to each of us. We are accepted, we are embraced, we are loved, we are forgiven, we are healed and restored in our hearts and in our spirits, in our minds because of you. And we want to live in the joy of the one who has been given more grace than we could ever imagine and that we know we could never deserve. Help us to know that we have been made children by your love, your children. And that we are given the grace of being able to serve and be a part of what you're about. And that's when we know what it means to go into the family business. Children who live to make our father proud. Who live in the joy of grace and acceptance. And the wonder at being a part of it all. Help us to choose grace. Help us to choose love. Help us to choose hope for every lost person on this planet believing that your grace is big enough, abundant enough, incredible enough to be given freely to all. Help us to live the right way with the right perspective that we might give grace away as freely as it's been given to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24, and then verse 27. For to me, living means living for Christ. And dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come to see you again or only hear about you, 
I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. To make that our blessing for today. May your heart be filled with the desire to see Jesus. And may your life overflow with the knowledge that your time here is a blessing because it's your opportunity to do his good work. May you find your life shaped toward the grace and love of the good news of Christ. And may we all grow in our experience of the unity of the church of Jesus and the mission for all of us that is found in that same good news.